the know-it-alls in your lecture halls who always seem to be asking too many questions, and the FSO members who are covered head to toe in glitter, jumping up and down with cheers and chants. It's easy to look at these people and think, I don't think anything bad has ever happened to you in your entire life. I was probably that girl in high school. Not only was I an active member of band, choir, and drama, I was homecoming queen. I was president of Key Club International and an active member of National Honor Society, Student Government, and Science Club. I also worked about 40 hours a week. However, I also dealt with, and still deal with, mental illness. When I was 15 years old, I was diagnosed with major depressive disorder and generalized anxiety disorder. When I was 17 years old, I was placed in the care of a psychiatric hospital after I attempted to take my life in the spring semester of my senior year. There, I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Bipolar disorder, as defined from Merriam-Webster Dictionary in 2018, can be defined as several psychological disorders characterized by the alternating episodes of depression and mania. What that means is that when I was manic, I was on top of the world. I felt like I had adrenaline running through my veins. I didn't have to sleep. I didn't have to eat. I felt like I was fine. However, during my depressive episodes, I couldn't get out of bed. I couldn't look at myself in the mirror. I didn't have the energy to brush my teeth, to shower, to brush my hair. I felt like life wasn't worth living anymore. Sometimes I would feel them both at the same time or within the same day. One time during a manic depressive episode, I went into my kitchen, found all the glassware I could find, and smashed it, trying to feel something, guilt, empathy. But it just ended up with me on the ground of my kitchen, surrounded by broken glass, sobbing. However, my story isn't unique. It isn't one in a million. It isn't even one in a thousand. If you look to your left and you look to your right, Rufarts wrote an article in 2017 stating that one in three college freshmen reported mental health issues within the last year. So it may not be you. And it may not be that person sitting next to you. But statistics, but statistics show that if you don't think you know someone that deals with mental illness, then you're wrong. Here at Missouri State, we, we strive for community engagement. And what is better than to come together as a community to learn build up and to love. During my speech today, I will be talking about the different types of mental illness, how it is affected in our academic positions, as well as the stigma that surrounds it, and what we can do to make a difference. <coughs> mental illness doesn't only affect your favorite film characters, novella characters, people in movies, but the people that you surround yourself with in everyday life. Justin Hunt wrote an article in 2010 stating that one half of college students fit the criteria for one or more mental disorder, with 18% for a personality disorder, 12% 12 for an anxiety disorder, and 11% for mood disorder, such as bipolar or major depressive. He also goes on to state that 24% of those with a depressive disorder don't get help. The Center for Community, the Center for Comedy and Mental Health in 2016 stated that students visiting counseling centers, even though they increased by about 30%, enrollments only increased by about 5%. So what is preventing the people that we love and care about from getting the help that they need? The answer is stigma. Samiri so writes in his article in November of 2017 stating that there are three different types of stigma someone with mental illness can face. First is a guilt stigma in which the person fears rejection, inadequacy, or failure within themselves. The second is a family stigma which involves rejection from the people that they love. And the third is a social stigma which can affect their acculturation into society. Justin Hunt also wrote in his article that mental disorders account for one half of the disease burden in young adults. And in 2008, the ACHA and CHA found that one in three students in undergraduate within the past year felt so depressed they can't even function, and one in 10 had suicidal ideations. After finding that only 24% of those diagnosed with depression were receiving help, he also found that less than half of those with a mood disorder and less than 20% of those with an anxiety disorder were in the same boat. In this study, less than half of those who screened positive for depression or anxiety have received any help within the past year. Some of the barriers that prevent the people that we love surround ourselves with from getting the help that they need is time,
privacy concerns, money, a lack of emotional openness. They don't think that it works or they don't think that this applies to them. Pace wrote an article in 2016 stating that only 30% of college kids know what help is offered to them on campus. That means that 70% don't, which means if one in three undergraduates feel so depressed they can't function, but seven in 10 don't know the help that is offered to them, that's not an equation I'd like to add up. We need to face mental illness head on and as fast as we can. I wouldn't be here today without medical attention from the people I love, from school personnel, from psychologists, from counselors. However, I am one of the lucky ones because our school psychologists are overworked and understaffed. In an article written in 2017 by Vestetta, which it talks about the shortages in school psychology, it states that there are 500 to 700 students in the secondary education system per one school psychologist. However, in 2014 through 2015, the national average was 1 to 1,383. In another article published by the International Association of Counseling Services in 2018, it states that the average college campus is 1 to 1,600. Can you imagine being in charge of 1,600 students' mental health? You can't give the service that you want to give if you're spread so thin. You wouldn't tell someone with the flu to go home and sleep it off, and you should do the same thing with mental illness. Tao talks in his article in 2014 stating that suicide is the second leading cause of death in college students. So what can we do as college students to make a difference? Well, the first, well, the first thing is to get educated and know your symptoms. It's more than likely that someone that you know is hurting and may be too afraid to speak out. Make sure you can tell if there's a difference in their demeanor or personality, and if or when they do choose to speak, you speak from a place of love and acceptance. The second thing that you can do is stand up and stand out. Too often do students stand back when action needs to be taken in their community because we don't think we can make a difference. But we can. The bystander effect is the idea that within a group of people, somebody else is going to take action before you do. But you can be that person. Change starts with you. And the third thing that you can do is be kind to yourself. If you are facing mental illness, know that you are loved, that people love you, that they care about you, and that they want to help you. Small strides are still strides. Small steps are still steps. You're not inherently evil for feelings that you can't control. And people are there to love and help you on your journey. During my speech today, we have talked about different types of mental illness. We've talked about how it affects our education system, as well as the stigma that surrounds it, and what we can do to help. I wouldn't be here today without the medical treatment, the therapy, the counseling, and the medicine that I got. But all this was accessible to me because when I said I was hurting, the people around me listened. You can be that person for somebody else. Change starts with you. It starts with your words, it starts with your actions, and it starts with your heart. I want you to use your heart today and your knowledge to make a difference in the people's lives around you, a difference in your community, bring light to the significance and relevance of mental illness in today's society, and to make the world a better place full of a lot more love. Don't stand back. Stand up and stand out for what is important. And each and every one of you are important. Thank you.